Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the Streets Photog Podcast. I'm your host, David Joseph Del Grand. Now, this episode is special. On January 20th, I got to rap about my creative journey with my newfound brethren. Jake Feinberg is a music journalist with an inexhaustible muse. What bonds the soul with tunes? And who are the cats, as he's dubbed them, that keep the fire blazing? We share a day job now and bonded immediately over the elements that grow iconoclasts and outliers. I'm not a musician, but my poetic output places me akin to the quote, dreamers of the dreams. This is part one of a two-part series. Tune in, baby. Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Comedy on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And a couple months ago, I wound up getting a gig with the Friends of the Library in Pima County in Tucson. It's been such a blessing to become part of this family. And uh, one of the cats who works there, I've connected with immediately, uh, sort of a a brethren, uh, somebody who cares about art, street art and photography in particular, but he's also spent a lot of time in print journalism and has many stories to tell. David Del Grande, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks so much for having me, bro. Uh, it's definitely an honor. It is an honor. You know, can you talk about a time in your life, um, it could be any time, when you really were facing adversity how you overcame it, and how it made you a stronger person. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of episodes in that particular, you know, I don't know, era of life when it comes to, hey, you know, this is where I'm at in life. I have diversity I have to overcome. And, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of if you fall 10 times, you got to get up 11. I think one of the things that carried over the most for me was being a skateboarder in the 90s. So like mid 90s, I got heavily into skateboarding. It wasn't the cool thing. And I don't know, it, it taught me a sense of, of humility and a sense of perspective when it came to just life and adversity. And I mean, if you've ever spent any time in a skateboard, no, you're no, no. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. But when you do, totally, you, totally. You, you fall all the time. Like, like if you're not falling, you're not skating. Like that's what skateboarders say. And yeah, I mean, that just put, a, you know, a chip on my shoulder and some real determination to, you know, if I'm going to get the trick or if I'm going to get the byline or if I'm going to get the photo, I'm going to get it come hell or high water. And, you know, that that education on the streets in New York City and, and New Jersey and, and the East Coast in general just gave me a little bit of hoofspa that that got me through a tremendous amount of adversity throughout my life. I mean... Being a journalist alone, yeah, you got adversity. <laughs> Did you wind up, uh, like, becoming a competent skateboarder? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, we had a small crew of people. Um, actually, a friend of mine in Jersey still has a skate company out there. Mm. And, you know, there was some, you know, we definitely had some heavy hitters. And, you know, I was definitely, you know, top tier. I, I could hold my own at that time. You know, I wanted to ask you about, like, when you – recognized or I you know for me um 
my definition of success has nothing to do with you know anything uh, related to commodities or monetization, especially as it relates to my craft or my skills or you know I consider like I think I maybe even told you this before, but it, you know as a journalist, how can I be singular? How can I be unique? How can I do something that's going to cut above the morass of what everybody else is doing that as broad in broadcasting? And that's my definition of success. So, I mean, let's, taking print journalism or just in anything, when did you kind of get the memo that you wanted? What is your definition of success? And do you believe, and what is it that you're doing, whether it's the photography or even going back to journalism that helped you be singular? Well, I mean, you know, I'm a little older now, so I guess success has always kind of morphed as, you know, any target really morphs as you age. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, wisdom comes with that and, you know, making mistakes and, you know, hurting yourself and hurting people around you and losing people, whether it's to death or to, you know, disagreement, you know, it, it changes you and it puts, put notches on your belt. But for me, you know, at going on 43 this year, success for me is, if I'm waking up in the morning and I got a smile on my face and I know that my day is filled with stuff that, you know, activities that I'm interested in doing, whether it's paying the bills or not, I mean, I won the lottery (laughs) and that's, that's it. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, and it's, you know, coming from a print journalism background, it was also, you know, when I got into that industry, I was planning on going to the Middle East. I was going to, I was going to Lebanon. That's where I was headed. So I was, my minor was, conflict reporting in the Middle East. So I, you know, studied, you know, terrorist, terrorist organizations and stuff like that for years and years and years at a professional collegiate level before or after I was reading it for about 10 years, like studying, you know, Israel and Palestine and stuff like that. Um, So perspective is always kind of, it's played a huge role in my life, especially, you know, as I entered college as a non-traditional student, student, I mean, I graduated in 2018, so I was no spring chicken. So that perspective definitely carried over. Like I I understand what this country offers us, especially on a global scale. So like, I get it. We have a lot of work to do as a country and as a society, you know, in the United States. But, I mean, man, you compare it to most of the stuff I was reading on a, on a professional level on a daily basis. <laughs> Can you give an example? Oh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, there's obviously a, a wealth disparity in this country, correct? I mean, but, you know, globally, if you're making, I think the latest stat that I looked at, it's like if you're making $38,000 a year, you're part of the global 1%. Wow. Like there's, I think it's half the world's population, last I checked, lives on less than two U.S. dollars a day. So that gives you like a little bit of perspective of where we're at. I'm not saying that like people aren't struggling and that the scales aren't tipped. Point like, taken, totally, you, you know what I'm totally. saying? But like, man, if you're in this country, and there's a few other countries like us, but, you know, we are unique in that sense. But if you're here, man, like you can – there's so much opportunity, and if you have the right mindset and you link with the right heads, it's a wrap. Why, why do you think that that's so hard for um, for people in public life to be able to expre- articulate what you just said? I think that um, regardless of the political spectrum you're on, uh, there is so much opportunity here in this country – and yet there's a lot of, um, you know, the cost of living has gone up a lot in the last 10, you know, decade or, you know, since the beginning of the century. Um, but I, I think that, you know, not to get political, but it's like in some ways there's a lot, there's one side that wants to sort of give away a lot of stuff, you know, basically disincentivizing the mindset uh, that you just were talking about. Uh, with just the opportunity to go out and, and just sort of create something, uh, especially when you look at it from the rest of the world. Um, and then there's another side that might come across as even kind of callous, like, you know, just pick yourself up by your bootstraps. And these guys are in their 80, 80s or 90s, and it, it, the life they had in the 40s and 50s has nothing, doesn't relate to anything going on today. What would you say is the mindset that people should have based on, now we're both, fair skin people, but I mean, what is the mindset, regardless of skin color, should people have in this country 
about the opportunity that actually does exist in this country. I mean, the, the friends at the library prove that to me once again, for me, in my own life. Yeah, I mean, again, like, I, I mean, I get it. Like, you know, there's definitely, I can walk into a room and it's easy for me not to be prejudiced against because I'm a white dude, you know, like, and I obviously probably come off as a hetero white dude. I get it. Like, like just that carte blanche, like in a point, point blank, like there's going to be doors that are going to open for me. I understand that. I'm not ignorant to that. But I mean, if you look at, I mean, it, it just compare our country opportunity wise to, to even our neighbors in the South. I mean, you know, I, I go to Mexico on a regular basis, whether it's dental work or it's just doing photo exposition stuff or just going to chill because it's a beautiful country and it's a, a short, short ride to go down in Nogales and hang out for a little bit. I mean, look at the exchange rate. It's just not even comparable. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is a country that was already established when, you know, this country was being founded on the backs of, you know, tragedy and, and, and our, our bloody history, which is obviously unfortunate in a, lot of, in a lot of senses. But when you compare what, what this country offers everyone to the rest of the world, it's just, it's not even on the same scale. It's just not. Talking to David Del Grande here on the Jake Feinberg Show. Did you actually, <clears throat> did you ever make it to the Middle East? And and um, and if if you didn't, um, how did you deal with the fact? I mean, I know for myself, like in sports broadcasting, I I had a cup of coffee in the minor league baseball, but I walked away from it. And it and in my early twenties, because I was too insecure, and it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth because I sort of didn't feel like I pushed myself your dream was to go and do some pretty daring work. Did you do it? And if not, how did you deal with the idea that, that, that maybe that dream didn't come to fruition, but there was something else? Unfortunately, I haven't made it out to the Middle East yet. And you do want to go. Yes. Yeah. So that's still a passion of mine. It's definitely an area of interest and it's, you know, obviously there's a lot of Stories that come from that particular region, especially if you're thinking of Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and that general, I mean, that's the, the birthplace of most of the, you know, the the religions that run our society as a whole. Um, and for me, it was just, I didn't want to go into that situation under the auspices of an industry that I didn't agree with any longer. Um, when I got into the industry... I mean, I got in pretty quick and I was earning a living even when I was in college. Um, but yeah, as I got further along in my college career and I knew that it was time to make a decision like, okay, am I going to take the plunge and become a full-time reporter and, and deal with the liabilities of that industry? And I can get into that later. Can you talk about those? Can you yeah, talk about you know, it's it's metric chasing. It's uh, it's right. clickbait kind of stuff. Explain it's, metric chasing to the audience. Okay, so metric chasing would be, um, you know, I did some reporting back east. I, I work for a, a large newspaper in New Jersey, and you know, uh, the people that were kind of mentoring me would say like, "Oh yeah, I'm going to go into this, you know, community that's largely." black and brown people do a police story because that's going to get me the clicks on my story so that I can chase the story that I actually want to do, whether it's like interviewing someone like, you know, Jake Feinberg <laughs> or, or, or doing a story that's right like there. a profile, you know what I mean? So it's like you get the clicks on this end because someone got shot in Newark so that you can chase, you know, the story that you actually have passion for. And for me, that wasn't worth putting my life on the line. And I knew that that was where the industry was headed more and more. And this is, you know, pre-Trump administration. This is pre-COVID pandemic. Um, the the writing was on the wall. And even in college, I mean, it, you know, I experienced it so much with, you know, university professors giving me a really hard time by talking to conservatives or talking to law enforcement and other reporters that I were coming up with. And are just like, wait, why do you want to talk to the county sheriff? I'm like, because he's running things. And we may not agree politically all the time, but this is like one of the highest elected officials in Pima County and is running a very important department. You better pay attention to this person. And, you know, I was the person that was willing to talk to law enforcement. So, like, I was like in this weird place of like, oh, like you're talking to law enforcement and stuff like that. And it was just like, yeah, because it's not my job to tell people what to think. 
It's my job to inform people what's actually going on, even when I didn't agree with that. 